Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our fifth talk um, celebrating the biodiversity of the um, World Bio Kensington Chelsea. Uh, in a second, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Mark Spencer, who's going to do a talk about wild plants of London. Um, there's some housekeeping instructions on our first slide, and we thank um, the friends for their continued sponsorship. Uh, the talk will last about an hour, and at the end, there'll be time for questions. If you do have any questions for Mark, um, feel free to write them in the comment um, Q&A box, and we'll ask him as many as we can at the end. We are suffering a few technical difficulties, so I am in control of the PowerPoint. So apologies for any delays as we go along. But um, Mark, over to you, and thank you very much for your time and your help with this talk. <laughs> right, um, very good. One moment. So terribly sorry, ladies and gentlemen, for this. I'm just getting myself back together after a, a joyous few minutes trying to get the internet to do the things we'd like it to do. Um, so I'm just sort of, Trevor, one piece of bad news is I can't see the screen. So this is great fun. I'm going to do this from my presentation. I don't know why it's not coming up on my screen. I'm in Teams but I'm going to have to do it from my PowerPoint. So you'll have to move on to the next PowerPoint when I tell you to move forward. OK, Sorry okay about excellent. That. No worries, Mark. Um, right. The first slide I've got is um, a viaduct. Very good. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is pretty much what you would think of as a typical urban habitat, you know, London with its railways, etc., etc. And I'm just going to pose a little quiz for you all for the, um, this particular image. What famous film does this come from? So we'll come back to that at the end of this talk. OK, right. Now, next slide, Trevor. Here we have what in many ways you think of as being the typical urban landscape and environment plants that are sometimes considered weedy, a bit rusty, tufty, growing on street corners many years ago in former bomb sites, and as we like to call them today, brownfield sites. Now, these kind of habitats are becoming increasingly uncommon as London becomes tidier and smarter, and it is getting harder and harder to find these plants. Having said that, many of them still remain common. So on the left, we have hoary mustard, this bright yellow member of the cabbage family. It's one of London's commonest members of this group of plants. The big jazzy pink thing in the background is common malla, Mal Malva sylvestris, and I'll come back to that a little bit later on. And in the bottom right hand corner, the plant with the grey foliage is mugwort, Artemisia vulgaris. <coughs> Now, one of the interesting things about all of these plants is that they're actually non-natives. They've been living in our landscape for many years. In the case of Malva sylvestris and Artemisia vulgaris, for hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years, so long so that we refer to them as archaeophytes, plants of the ancient environment. <clears throat> Excuse me, just trying to get myself back together again after that joy. Next slide, please, Trevor. Now, the next image we have is of maidenhair spleenwort. Now, one of the interesting things that's been happening in London over the last 30 or so years is as London's air quality has, broadly speaking, improved, um, acidity has been reduced through removing of sulphur, etc., from the atmosphere. Some of the plants which used to live on London's walls, which died out in the Victor late Victorian and the 20th century, are reappearing. <clears throat> So maidenhair spleenwort is one of these species, once very, very rare in inner London, it is now becoming locally frequent. This was actually photographed on some of the old Roman walls, not far from the Barbican um, in the city of London. This is a very fine species, which you find quite commonly on some of the old walls of London. However, one of the interesting things about inner London is that it's a microcosm. It's a climate unto itself. And this is something that's true of many, many cities. So we actually have all sorts of oddities turn up on occasion. So on the left hand side of this slide is sea. Oh, sorry, Trevor. So can you please move forward to the next slide? Apologies. Sea spleenwort. Now, this is sea spleenwort. 
And it looks a little bit like a common polypody for those of you familiar with this. But this is a really special plant because it actually comes primarily from the southern hemisphere. And as a British wild plant, it's largely found in southwest England and up the west coast into the warmer parts of Scotland. So it likes it warm and wet, as does lanceolate spleenwort. Now, weirdly, over the last decade or so, as London has got warmer, both of these species have turned up. Lanceolate, sleep, lanceolate spleenwort actually turned up in London, sorry, in King's Cross area about 15 years ago. Sadly, it did not persist because the wall upon which it was growing was cleaned and tidied up as part of the King's Cross development. Sea spleenwort still quietly hangs on near a railway arch not far from Waterloo Bridge, where it probably is being benefited on occasion from the odd splash of road salting. So these are two of the more curious and very rare ferns that you can find growing in London and are slowly taking hold because our climate is changing. Next slide, please, Trevor. <coughs> Now, oh, I just noticed a typo on my slide. Two very common and overlooked grasses that we have in London are the meadow grasses, these annual meadow grasses. And in this image on the lower part of the slide, you will see annual meadow grass. It's the darker green of the two plants. And the plant above it is early meadow grass, poa infirma. And these two plants are very, very closely related. In fact, Poa infirma is one of the parent species for annual meadow grass. Now, Poa infirma is a really, really interesting plant because up until very recently, it was only known to grow in the far west of Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. <clears throat> but as our climate has changed, this plant has moved rapidly along the south coast of England and is now colonising many of our inner, inner city areas. I'm now going to show you a series of four maps to illustrate this point. So this is the first map, and this is the non-native distribution of poa infirma in the London area before 2005. And you can see it's a very, very scarce plant. Each one of those dots probably actually represents, you know, a small patch on the edge of a park or something like that. So it was a very, very rare plant. However, as we move forward in time, next slide, please. You'll see that the abundance of this species increases. It's becoming more widespread. Now, this is probably partly because of the warming climate, but we also think it is probably quietly moving around, certainly in the London area, probably caught up in the machinery of mowing machinery, et cetera, et cetera, and the tools of council workers. So it seems to be more common in certain boroughs, such as Islington, because it's basically being helped around the environment by the work that people are doing. Next slide, please. Now, we get closer to the present day, 2000 up to 2015, and you can see that you know the dots are beginning to fill in. It is becoming more widespread. And finally, last slide, Trevor, a little bit more up to date, 2020. And it's probably fair to say, certainly in inner London and on these sort of Thames estuary areas that you can see to the east of the side of, of the map, actually, it is probably far more common than we realise, often as not, because people are actually a little bit frightened of identifying it, because you can see from the previous earlier slide, it's quite, quite similar to its commoner relative. Next slide. Now, Poa infirma is a Mediterranean plant. It likes it warm. It germinates in the winter and grows through the winter and flowers in spring and then dies off. And it's representative of quite a large cohort of annual plants from the Mediterranean, which are increasingly getting a foothold in the London area and Southern England. They're probably first arriving here as horticultural introductions. Accidentally, people buy large pot plants that may have been, you know, things like olive trees and palms that have been grown in Italy. And that transported plant material brings a lot of soil with these little weedy plants in them. One of my favorite on the left, left of this image is Mediterranean nettle, Vertica membranacea. Now, Mediterranean nettle is quite a benign little thing. It's got virtually no sting, 
so it's quite safe to get up too close to it and it has these rather attractive sort of cross-shaped flower spikes that are quite easy to see. In the middle we have common codweed, Philega germanica, and this is an interesting plant because Wild populations of this, because it's been grown in, it's been grown as a wild plant in Britain for hundreds, if not thousands of years, had died out or were dying out. But over the last decade or so, it's slowly becoming more common in London as it's being accidentally reintroduced into our city through horticulture. And the last and rather beautiful one is white ramping fuma tree. And this is the non-native subspecies of this plant. We have our own endemic one called subspecies Babingtonii um, and it's a rather handsome creature but it's largely found in the west of Britain and Ireland whereas Caprilata is a scarce but increasingly frequent denizen of London turning up on street corners in fact actually this particular specimen was photographed on the Regent's Canal in Hackney so these plants can turn up almost anywhere. Next slide please Trevor. Now, Britain is a nation of gardeners. We're most enthusiastic about the plants we grow and we bring them from far and wide. <clears throat> and I was very lucky a couple of years ago to visit New Zealand to see cabbage tree, Cordyline australis, growing in the wild, um, where it's a really, really important part of the ecosystem of New Zealand. It's a very popular coastal plant in Britain, growing a lot, and it's also known sometimes as the Torbay palm and it is very popular in London's gardens. This is a species which is increasingly self-seeding and germinating and spreading on the south coast and in inner London. And I quite often find seedlings of this plant growing in cracks and pavements and other things like that. More surprisingly, passionflower, that plant we think of very much as being deeply exotic and tropical, actually is also beginning to establish in the wild in London. Now, in most occasions, these plants are killed fairly quickly by council workers spread it spraying weed killer. But I know of two or three wild plants that have established on their own through, because the fruit is dispersed by birds, growing vigorously and actually in some places out competing other vegetation. And there's a particularly fine colony of this down in Woolwich for those of you who wish to go to South East London one day. <clears throat> Next slide, please, Trevor. Now, it's fair to say that London's plant life, particularly the native and long established plants, are having a hard time of it. Redevelopment of lands, building of houses, tidying up of street corners, weed killer, etc., etc., is causing many plants to become rarer and rarer. So things which even nationally are abundant, such as this Gallium verum latest bed straw, are actually pretty uncommon in large chunks of inner London and actually the populations are very fragmented. This particularly beautiful showing of it is at Warren Farm in West London which is a wonderful wonderful grassland site which is sadly at risk of being lost through development. Tragically many of London's grasslands really face this worrying fate. Next slide please Trevor. Again, this is an image also from Warren Farm. This is wild carrot, Dorcas carota. It's not the direct ancestor of our domesticated character um, carrot, but it's a very, very close relative. In fact, we refer to plants such as this as crop wild relatives. These wild plants, even common plants such as this wild carrot, are likely to hold precious and important genetic material that we need to preserve and conserve because they could be useful for us in the future, because this plant might have genetic traits to resist pests and diseases that our domestic plant could do with as our future becomes more and more challenging through climate change, increasing spread of invasive pathogens and things like that. So even an abundant and adaptable plant like the wild carrot is something that's not only beautiful, but it's actually potentially really important for our own well-being in the future. Next slide, please, Trevor. <clears throat> now, one of my favourite plants in the London area is Danewort or Dwarf Elder. Um, it's rather daftly named because it's not very dwarf at all. Dwarf Elder can grow eight, ten foot high. It's rather a large, exuberant plant. Um, 
and is fascinating. It's linked historically with territory that was dominated by Danish culture in the Middle Ages um, and is now largely restricted to, you know, urban and suburban areas, although it is spread into other parts of Britain. Now, London used to have, up until the development of the Lower River Lee, around um, the Olympic Park, some of the largest and finest patches of this plant in Britain. Hundreds of sort of flower spikes of this wonderful plant. It's incredibly beautiful, superb plant for insects. Uh, tragically, many of those plants were wiped out by the Olympics development. This particular patch, a Warren Farm, is actually on a piece of what was originally sort of landfill. And I strongly suspect that this one tiny patch in the west of London probably originated, you know, maybe from something like bombsite development or rubbish coming from East London and being dumped in West London. It's an incredibly beautiful plant, but beware because unlike elder, it is very, very poisonous. Not something you want to be nibbling. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to get a little bit watery now and talk about a delightful little plant called lesser water plantain. <clears throat> now, quite a few of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Elysma plantago aquatica, the water plantain, which is quite a large and attractive waterside plant. Lesser water plantain is a much, mare, much, much rarer plant. It's very scarce all over the British Isles and is increasingly at risk of extinction. We have one remaining site left in the whole of Greater London that I know of. It's actually in Finchley, of all places, um, not far from the North Circular, growing in a sort of sheltered area hidden away behind some um, um, willow trees. There's a tiny population with about 20 plants. It's a, wonderfully, a wonderful plant, very beautiful and very, very important because Britain and Ireland holds quite a large chunk of the world population of this plant. Now, when we're going out looking at plants in the London area, we tend to, you know, go off into the wilder parts and look for wonderful places. But even the most humanly created and constrained environment, such as Barbican Centre here on the right, is a place where we can admire plants. The lake of the Barbican Centre is actually one of the best places I know in inner London for aquatic plants. It's got all sorts of wonderful little things in there, although you have to be quite brave because it's fair to say most people uh, do look at you askance with you if you've got your nose in the water looking at little green things. Next slide please, Trevor. Now, Unfortunately, many of London's water plants are really not having a very good time. The canals are increasingly used for recreation and motorised boats do a lot in terms of chopping up the vegetation that's growing on the bottom and also they, create, they reduce the clarity of the water because of the silt they pull up. So many of our aquatic plants, such as broadleaf pondweed here, are not doing very well. This is one tiny patch growing on the lower river Lee. It's probably now gone because it was not far from the Olympic site. And many of our wonderful pondweed species are now increasingly rare. So if you ever see something like this, I'd be very keen to hear about it. Because at the moment we've got about three or four sites in the whole of North London for this plant. Next slide please, Trevor. Mm. Apologies, ladies and gentlemen, my voice is going today. Now, here we have two more plants that are associated usually with damp or very wet habitats in the London area. On the left is something you might be quite surprised by. This is fen nettle. This is a very, very close relative of the stinging nettle. But you know, if you look at the foliage, you'll see that it's actually much longer and narrower than your typical stinging nettle from the end of your garden or from a roadside near you. And actually another thing about this plant that is really interesting is it is virtually stingless. And it also grows really tall. I've seen plants of this about 12 foot high. Fen nettle is an unusual and scarce plant that seems to be associated with ancient habitats where grazing animals didn't get in. Thus it doesn't need to have stingers because it's not under pressure from being eaten, because otherwise it's very tasty. 
So fen nettle is a very, very uncommon plant in the London area, although you can find patches of it here and there along the River Colne, for example. But it's under-recorded, so it might be hiding in nearby places. In fact, very recently, I found it growing on the Greenwich Peninsula in the ecology park there, uh, which was quite a surprise. Another plant which I'm very, very fond of and much, much smaller scale, you know, the silverweed Potentilla anzarina with pretty little um, yellow flowers, somewhat like a buttercup, but these are this amazing foliage, which is so distinctive, usually grows in incredibly short, often quite heavily mown grass or areas where geese love to have a nibble. A lot of people grumble about Canada geese in London, but actually many of these sort of geese mown grasslands or these heavily mown grasslands support communities of these small plants that can't survive in the roughier, tuftier world where large burly plants such as fed nettle grow. So even short grass can be really, really valuable for some of London's more interesting and often threatened species. Next slide, please. So let's have a little bevy of buttercups for a moment. I won't be talking about the more common species, but some of the ones that you're possibly less familiar with. So on the left, we have celery leaf buttercup. This is still a fairly common plant growing along damp corners on canal sides and riverbanks or on wet mud by ponds. And it has these very, very distinctive little almost star-shaped flowers with a very, very big green centre as the fruit develops. And it also has quite thick, lush foliage. It's, and it's an annual, so you won't see any rootstocks coming off. It's quite an easy plant to recognise. One that is harder to recognise and it takes practice is the hairy buttercup, Ranunculus sardus. And it looks quite similar to the other species of buttercup that you might be familiar with, but it tends to grow in the east of London, um, as in places like Barking and Dagenham, and often in areas where people are grazing horses because it's unpalatable to horses and it can thrive in this very, very short grass. So if you're out in East London and you see really short, dry, heavily grazed grass with lots of little buttercup in, it's probably this species. And the final one is Goldilocks, Ranunculus auricomus. Now Goldilocks is an incredibly complicated group of buttercups. That's why we have the phrase ag, for aggregate on it, because we're actually only really getting to grips with their diversity. There are like probably dozens of species in Britain. This is a particularly large flowered form growing in Harefield. Oh. And Harefield, like other parts of London, are, is a really important refuge for veteran landscape and for veteran trees, such as this wonderful beech tree, it's actually photographed in Epping Forest, and also this wonderful pedunculate oak from down in um, Richmond. So London is a very, very important part of North Northwest Europe for its ancient and veteran trees and the associated landscape around it. Move on to the next one, please, Trevor. Further afield, in a place that probably not that many people get to, is the wonderful Trent Park, right on the northern edge of the city. Trent Park has got some fantastic hornbeam woodlands and is also very, very rich in fungi. So me and my fellow fungus folk quite often go up to or um, up to Trent Park when we're looking for specialty fungi. And in spring, next slide please, Trevor. It will be host to plants such as the wood anemone. <clears throat> now the wood anemone is a really, really interesting plant because Whenever you see wild populations of this growing, you can be pretty confident you're in ancient landscape. Because unlike the bluebell, which can skip around in the environment quite quickly, it can move very fast, relatively speaking. It can move and colonize woodland in a matter of decades. Wood anemone is very, very slow growing. So if you see a patch of wood anemone, it's probably hundreds of years old and you're in old landscape. So it's always a really good indicator that you're in somewhere special and one of London's older ancient woodlands. Next slide please. <clears throat> now we've got a very, very slow growing. 
and I decided to unmute me. So on this particular slide, we've got two old images from a German flora of two wonderful plants from British woodlands. The image on the right is of lily of the valley. Now, lily of the valley is quite a common plant in certain parts of Britain still, usually associated with quite alkaline soils, but will be found in other places as well. May lily on the F on the left is a much, much rarer relative of Lily of the Valley. And sadly, the one population that we did have in London is now extinct. It's used to grow in Hampstead Heath. There's a bit of a debate about its status in, in Hampstead, but um, sadly, we can no longer really argue it too much because it died out probably sometime in the 1950s. Next slide, please, Trevor. Another plant along with, you know, lily of the valley and um, wooden enemy that we can refer to as a ancient woodland axiophyte, which means, you know, a plant that is highly indicative of a rich and ancient habitat, is the common cowweed. This is Melampyrum pretensi with little snapdragon-y type flowers. And it's moderately, it's reasonably closely related to snapdragons. Um, but it has something special about it because this is a parasite. This plant cheats, it sticks its roots into the syst root systems of other plants and steals nutrients from them. Sadly, this plant is now very, very scarce in North London. There are only two very small um, sites for it, one of which is in um, Queenswood and the other one is in the Ricelip Wood complex in the west of London. So this is now sadly a very, very scarce species. Um, and it is declining right across much of southeast England. Next slide. Now a very close but deeply different looking relative to the common cowweed is ivy broom rape. These two plants are both members of the Orobankaceae, which is fairly closely related to things like snapdragon and buddleia. Now, this plant is also a parasite, but it takes it to another level because it is, has no green foliage. It doesn't do any photosynthesis. It is totally dependent upon its host plant, in which, in which case this is, not surprisingly, ivy. Now, ivy broom rape is another benefit of, benefiter of climate change. It used to be a very rare plant in the London area, but is now becoming increasingly frequent still patchy so in areas where you've got nice big patches of ivy where it can snuggle down and grow. So this is always an interesting plant to find and usually quite easy to identify because it has these amazing brown spires sticking out of the leaf litter and usually you'll find it attached to the ivy if you scrape down very carefully. Fascinating and wonderful plant. Next slide please. <clears throat> Now, sticking with the woodland theme, I'm just going to talk quickly about crab apples because crab apples are, we are realizing, much rarer than we thought they were. We've always thought of crab apple as being quite a common tree in lowland Britain, but as we've understood the diversity of apples and particularly our domesticated apple, we're realizing that real Malvus sylvestris, Malvus sylvestris the crab apple, is much scarcer. Fruit size is a terrible indicator of whether you've got the real thing or not, because you can have, you know, garden throwouts of domesticated apple with really small, small bit of fruit. If you're not sure, turn the leaf over. If the underside of the leaf, and you'll need a hand lens to do this, is almost entirely smooth with no hairs, you've probably got crab apple. If it's hairy, even if the fruit is small, you've got domesticated apple. And there's a lot of confusion about apparently easy to identify in common trees and shrubs in the London area because we have lots of things which we refer to as lookalikes. So large sepaled hawthorn, which is actually from Southeast Europe, has been grown unwittingly in Britain for possibly 150 years, maybe longer, and has been sold and traded and passed around under the belief that it was our common hawthorn, Criticus monogyna we're now starting to realize that it's a bit of a pickle 
And in fact, in inner London, nearly all hawthorn is actually large sepaled hawthorn. Um, and it does take practice to separate the two. But broadly speaking, large sepaled hawthorn has much larger, almost ceiling wax coloured berries, fruit rather, compared than compared to a common or ordinary hawthorn. Next slide. Now, this is one of my bet noirs in the London area, tree of heaven or tree of hell. Ilanta saltissima is an emerging severe and ecologically damaging plant in Northwest Europe. It's already recognized as being a serious pest species in, in, in France, where it can cause severe damage to railway infrastructure roads because it has very, very tough rootstocks. And it is also causes quite significant ecological damage because it outcompetes other vegetation. It also potentially is a risk to human health because the sap can cause burning in bright sunlight. So Tree of Heaven is becoming a serious concern for us biologists in the London area. And we are really probably going to have to find a way of resolving what we're going to do with this in the future. Next slide. So Tree of Heaven is problematic, but then we have other non-natives, such as the Mexican fleabane, um, which you can guess where that's from, which the jury's still out. Some people are quite concerned because it tends to grow on walls and is probably out-competing some of the small wall ferns that we I was talking about briefly earlier on. On the upside is a delightful, very beautiful, and is also very, very popular with a wide range of pollinators. Now, Mexican fleabane is a member of the daisy family, and one of its relatives are the ragworts. One of the things that happens when you put species of plant which are not used to each other and not normally close to each other, they sometimes hybridize. So on the right of this image, we have Jacobea albescens, and that's a hybrid of our native ragwort with um, the uh, garden plant, Cineraria, as many people would know, the plant with silvery grey foliage, which you find often as bedding. And you'll see on the top of the image of that, I've got the Cineraria leaf on the left, the hybrid in the middle, and on the right, our native ragwort. And if you put the two together, you get this rather curious thing called Jacobea albescens. This was actually growing in a cemetery in northwest London. Next slide, please. So urban areas are hotbeds for evolution, because if you put things that didn't previously grow with each other, they do things like hybridize. So I mentioned common mallow earlier on, and common mallow can and does hybridize with some of its relatives. And on the right of this image, you have the extremely rare hybrid Malva dissipiens, which has only been found once in Britain by yours truly, growing on a canal side in Islington about 10 years ago. So it's a very, very rare plant, but potentially this movement of DNA through plants hybridizing can change how they evolve and where they all end up in the future. Next slide, please. Two beautiful and very widespread, often as not, plants of walls in London area with ghastly names are the trailing bellflower, Campanula portenschlagiana on the left, and the Adria bellflower, Campanula portenschlagiana on the right. Both of these plants originally hail from um, Southeast Europe, from the Balkan Peninsula. In fact, actually, Poshaskayana is a very, very rare plant in the wild, whereas it's very common in parts of London and Southern England. It's possible that these two species hybridize. We've seen plants that look quite likely to be intermediate. So again, London is acting as a hotbed for evolution with these species. Next slide. Now, one of my favourite plants in London is this rather demure little member of the cabbage family. This is London Rocket. Now, London Rocket gets its name because of one very important event in London's history, which is the Great Fire of London. This is a non-native plant. It was documented as a wild plant in London um, some 30, 40 years before the Great Fire. However, I should know longer than that, my brain's gone to custard. Anyway, I'll stop that for a moment and start this sentence again. But one of the really important things about this plant is after the Great Fire, 
this plant turned up in swathes all across the burn, burn, the burn sites of the city. So it became incredibly common. And then, of course, as the city was rebuilt, it gradually vanished to the point where by the end of the 19th century and into the early 20th century, it was more or less extinct in London. Over the last 20 years, with our climate warming and possibly through repeated introductions from Southern Europe, this plant is gradually becoming more common. So we actually now have at least two different forms. The one on the left with the more chromy yellow flowers is locally quite frequent in East London along the canals and around the Tower of London. The one with the rather sort of paler, rather insipid flowers on the right um, seems to be a plant primarily of the Islington area, although I have seen it in a couple of other parts of London as well. So these plants, again, are kind of responding to what us human beings do, you know, us introducing genes, you know, introducing plants from other parts of the world. And with climate change on top, we do not really know what the future for London rocket will be, but it will be fascinating. Next slide. Now, as you're picked up, London is definitely full of winners and losers in terms of the race to survive when it comes to plants. And here are two really, really interesting ones. On the left is rue leaf saxifrage. These are both native plants of these. Now, 20 years ago, rue leaf saxifrage was incredibly rare in London. There were probably 100 or so plants a year growing and very, very few sites. So much so that we really felt it was probably quite likely to become extinct in London. And uh, similarly with meadow saxifrage, which is similarly very rare in London, it's only found in this image, is actually from Kew Green, where there's a small patch that survives the mowers every year. Now, meadow saxifrage continues to be rare, tragically, because it's a beautiful, beautiful plant. But rue leaf saxifrage has done something amazing. We don't understand what's happening, but over the last decade or so, it has moved into new habitats and new landscapes and become very common on railway track beds, particularly around the major stations such as Victoria and Waterloo. So it now grows in the million in a few places. So this is a species that's doing very well. Next slide. Now, we're in the Queen's backyard, Buckingham Palace. Now, about a decade ago, I had the uh, um, fortune to go out with various other botanists from the London Natural History Society and botanise in the Queen's backyard. And we made a stunning discovery, Cephalanthera damazonium, the white helleborine. Now, this was amazing because this was the first record of this plant species in at least 100 years in North London. The last time it was seen was in Harefield in about 1905. We were very, very pleased to find it. There was actually quite a healthy colony of this wonderful, beautiful orchid growing at this site. And fingers crossed, it's still doing very well. Next slide. So we can come up with surprises. Here's another one sticking with the orchid theme. This is the lizard orchid. This used to be an incredibly rare plant in Britain. With climate change, it seems to be doing very well. And about 15 years ago, for the first time in at least 300 years of botany recording and looking at plants in the London area, this plant turned up in North London. The image on the right is of a small fence that was erected around it to protect it. Um, unfortunately, it's fair to say the site which the plant still lives on has now been treated extremely hostilely. The site has actually been developed um, it's been fenced in and most of the area has been covered with membrane and wood chip. But there is this tiny, tiny little wall still around it. So it's probably the smallest nature reserve in Britain. I have to say it's a pretty appalling way of treating one of our rarest wild plants. So it's an amazing thing. Next slide, please. Now, many of us often see in urban areas, you know, wildflower seed mixes, there's a lot of talk of them on social media, and they're often full of delightful plants such as corn cockle, the pink plant, and corn flower, the blue plant on the right. These are actually both images from wild populations of these two plants, um, and they are now very rare plants growing in the wild. They're not native, they're what we refer to as archaeophytes. They've been in our landscape for thousands of years. And it's fair to say, next slide please, Trevor, that these wild plants 
these 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 cornflower plants often don't have growing in these seed mixes these less exciting looking plants such as spreading hedge parsley on the left and annual norwell growing on the right both of these plants are now nationally endangered and very very rare these two images were taken from a field site in the north of london on the border with hertfordshire so we often think about, you know, when we plant seed mixes about, oh, you know, we've done something wonderful, but we tend to do it based upon what we find aesthetically appealing because I've never seen a seed mix with hedge parsley or annual norwell in them. Next slide. Now, botanically, one of the most interesting areas in London is the Hampton Court area. And one of the stars of the show is Autumn Squill. Autumn squill is a relative of the bluebell. It's a much, much smaller plant that you find growing in dry acid grassland. It's probably still in flower at the moment now, and it's a delightful but tragically increasingly rare plant. Most of the populations on the River Thames have been wiped out. So the Hampton Court plants are now very, very important. Next slide. Just go with a few pretties now for a moment. Orchids obviously capture many people's imagination and we're seeing some variable results, so to speak, when it comes to wild orchids in Britain. Both the pyramidal and the bee orchid on the left um, and the centre on the left are doing quite well in the London area. They seem to be gradually colonising new, new locations and you can even find them on occasion in places like Hyde Park where the grass is left not to be and not mown. Unfortunately, green-winged orchid, things are going in the other direction largely. This is a plant which is nationally much rarer than it used to be. Nearly all of the original wild sites in London have now been damaged so greatly that all the wild populations are gone. But amazingly, this plant has now turned up on two or three um, green roofs in various parts of inner London. So even that is seeing a small turn in fortune, but it is very, very rare in London now. Next slide. Orchids are, you know, often associated with chalk grasslands, and I thought we'd just go to South London, to the Croydon area, and show you, you know, some of the stars of the show of South London and the chalky areas of the South, clustered bellflower, common century, and crossword. These are all highly charismatic and actually generally reasonably common with the exception of the bellflower but even so they need our love and care and attention because many of the grasslands that these plants are growing in are increasingly becoming scrubbed over. Next slide. Other plants that you'll find growing in these places, plants such as bush fetch, Vicia craca and chicory. These both of these plants are not surprisingly incredibly beautiful but they are very, very important plants for um, pollinators and, you know, definitely worthy of cultivation in the garden. Actually, wild chicory is considered at risk of extinction in Britain because its numbers have dropped quite severely over the last um, 30 years or so. Next slide. <clears throat> so I have some more members of the pea family, close relatives of bush fetch. Vicia sativa is a really fascinating plant, it's a very common plant on the left. Now if you look at a plant of this closely next spring when it's growing and you see the flowers, if you turn the foliage up on the underside you'll see right near the base of the leaf a little structure called a stipule and it'll have a little black brown dot on it. And that brown dot is a nectary and it produces nectar which attracts ants and those ants tend and look after the plant, they harvest the nectar and they kill and eat things like aphids etc etc and thus protect the plant. So both plant and ant benefit. Another very common plant in inner London, particularly in places that are a bit rusty tufty and dry, canal edges, brownfield sites, is sand lucerne. <clears throat> And it is very well known as Varia because the colour is incredibly variable. You can see on this flower that it's yellowy green on the bottom and purpley at the top. And you can get all sorts of colour in this kind of general range. I've seen things, flowers which are almost pure yellow and others which are bright, bright purple. It's a very challenging plant to identify sometimes. Next slide. 
Now, this plant is a real mystery for London because wild licorice, astragalus, is usually associated with, with chalk. Um, but bizarrely, there's a colony of it growing on the Greenwich Peninsula. Nobody knows how it got there. It grows in the Greenwich Peninsula Ecology Park. There's no record of it being planted, but it is definitely one that's well worth a visit. It's a fascinating and wonderful plant. In the wild, it quite often grows along things such as the man orchid. Next slide, please. Now, the River Thames, you know, immensely important to the history of London. Sadly, it's fair to say that much of London has now lost its riverside vegetation. Tripcock Ness in South East London, Greenwich area as well, and Bexley area is well worth a visit. Fascinating environment where you can get a hint of what London use was, London River Thames was like once upon a time. And it supports some quite important plants which are now scarce in the London area. Next slide. You won't find Slender's hair at Slender Hairs here there because it's only found in one place near the mouth of the River Darrant, right on the very edge of London. But you will see sea aster, which is really quite a common plant on the Thames and seems to be becoming more abundant. And that's probably because the River Thames is getting saltier and rising. So again, these plants are giving us an indication of what's happening to our environment and how things are changing. Next slide. Two delights that I'm very fond of. This is strawberry clover on the left, which is a wild native British plant. Sadly, now very rare in London. There's about 10 sites, I would think, something like that. But it has a rather quirky and cute little relative called the woolly clover, Trifolium tomentosum, which only grows on black heath. It's not an, it's, it's non-native. It was introduced by accident. We don't know how, but it's great fun to look for because you'll be walking around over black heath and then all of a sudden you'll see it because it looks like people have thrown little blobs of cotton wool all over the grass. It's a delightful little plant. Next slide. Now, I've mentioned grassland being in trouble in the London area, and it's fair to say that, you know, sometimes tree planting is a significant contributor. This is Horsenden Hill and the rather tritely named Whitler's Wood, which unfortunately was planted over species rich grassland um, and has caused huge amount of ecological damage um, and is very, very distressing for botanists such as myself. Next slide because Horsenden Hill, not this particular area where the trees were planted, is the only place in North London where Dyer's greenweed still grows. Wonderful, wonderful member of the pea family, a relative of broom. And if you ever find Dyer's greenweed, it basically looks like a broom plant growing in the grass. You know you're in really important ancient landscape. Next slide. Now, here's a few rather snazzy members of the mint family that are always well worth looking out for. Marsh woundwort is still quite common along the canal um, and you'll often find it growing in cracks and fragments, particularly in the west of London and parts of the River Crane and the Coal, etc. A much, much rarer plant, which is only known from Lesnes Abbey Wood in South East London, is Lesser Calamint. This is nationally endangered and Lesnes Abbey population is the only one in London and it nearly had trees planted all over it. And then on the right, we have the nationally still common wood sage, delightful thing with these beautiful sort of limey green flowers, which again, sadly, in much of North London is not very common. It's doing better in parts of South East, South London though. Next slide. Another rarity that has just recently turned up in Lesnes Abbey Wood is this fascinating member of the cabbage family, tower mustard. And what's amazing about this particular plant at Lesnes is it probably was surviving in the seed bank for dozens, if not decades, many decades, until such time as somebody cultivated the ground and up, up popped tower mustard. So we now have two sites in London for this nationally rare plant. Next slide. This is one of my favourite places in London because it's really part of actually the history about how we've started to change our attitude towards the landscape and the environment in London. Camley Street is, you know, a green oasis for people living in the Kings or living and working in Kings Cross. But it is also culturally really important because it is one of the first purpose-built created landscapes. 
And, you know, getting these sites right is really important. Next slide. You know, we need to be thinking very carefully about the kind of plants we want to put into it. This is images from another, which for my view, successful created landscape, and that is the um, Greenwich Peninsula Ecology Park, which is well worth visiting. Both wild marjoram and meadow sweet are really, really important plants, um, supporting a huge diversity of invertebrates. Now, one thing that I'm often asked is, you know, what should I be planting in my garden for wildlife? Next slide. I would have these two things, wild marjoram and meadow sweet. But these three fabulous creatures as well. Oh, I've done something very naughty. I've just noticed on the label. That's, um, please don't read the label. I forgot to change that. On the left, we have um, common knapweed, centaurium. At the top, in the middle, sorry, we have fleabane, pulicaria. And on the right, hemp agrimony. These three common and adaptable members of the daisy family are incredibly rich in nectar and pollen. They're really fantastic for wild animals and invertebrates, and they look great as well. Next slide. Oops, excuse me, I've just frozen, apologies. Now, how do we get to know all of this? It's through people like this. This is the London Natural History Society, the botany section, out recording and observing London's plants. So if you're not a member of the Natural History Society or one in your area, please do join one because this is how you learn. I've learned so much about London's flora from going out with these wonderful people and having a chat, having a gossip and studying our plant life. Now, right at the beginning, I posed a question to you all. Do you know what film that railway arch was from? And the answer is The Lady Killers. Thank you very much. And hopefully we'll be able to get turn things on to go to questions now. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, thanks very much, Mark. Apologies again for the technology difficulties we had. So yeah, there are a few questions. I'm just going to bring them up uh, yep. for you now. And uh, can is everyone still on? So, uh, right, I've, I can see questions now. Yeah, um, sorry, I'm just bringing them up. Shall I? So, hopefully, everyone can see me. Bit? Yeah, if you want to read some of the questions, Mark, I can't actually see them as well. I'm yeah. having <laughs> as well. <laughs> cool. really having today, okay. Um, okay. Right, so somebody in Oxford has asked, how do you spell Xio? It's Axiophyte. It's A X I O P H Y T E. So these are plants which are axiomatic, highly indicative of particular types of habitat. I can see you visually now, Trevor, but I can't hear you. Yeah, I'm still here, but I've got the Great. questions up, so yes. Uh, yeah. Great. So I've answered that one. Thank you very much, Oxford. Um, so the next question down, Mark, which you're probably reading as well, is someone asking about um, cowweed. Yeah, cowweeds in flower, when, when to find it. Now, cowweed, um, certainly on the Isle of Wight, it was flowering right up until about two weeks ago. It's going over now. So really, it is a plant for mid to high summer. Okay. And then um, someone's asking, uh, Wayne Woods asking a question about um, the London's oldest continuous population of plants or communities. So I presume like an untouched area of plants in London. Yeah. Is there such a place? First off, hello, Wayne. Wayne's actually calling from the other side of the world, folks. Ah, He's cool. Calling from Australia. Good, good to hear. Um, sorry, um, the technology's gone pear shaped, Wayne. Oh, there's a challenging one. I would say probably the ancient woodlands. Certainly in London, places like um, Hampstead Heath, Queenswood and other woodlands such as the ones in West London, which are the Ricelip Woods. Most of the grasslands in the London area have been quite heavily changed or modified and particularly in North London, most of the grasslands are relatively speaking, fairly young, because much of what we call the county of Middlesex was essentially a market garden to keep London fed and watered right through the late Middle Ages up until the 
beginning of the 20th century, really, and there are still areas which are market gardens. So a lot of the landscape in London is, in the London area, is quite young, with the exception of some of these woodlands. Cool. And then Fiona um, asked a question, what do you think London's um, wildflower would be? <laughs> oh, oh. oh what, would, what would you say, Mark? Everyone probably have different views, I assume. Oh my gosh, that is an immensely difficult one because being a botanist, I'd choose about a hundred. Um, <laughs> you've only got 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, gosh, you've got me on the hop there. I think it would have to be, um, whether we like it or not, London Plain, maybe. Um, you know, I mean, it's fair to say um, most of the things which are deeply emblematic of London are things like London Plain, Budlier, many of which are actually largely problematic um, to varying degrees. London Plain is an immensely important plant in Britain, in London, because it actually reduces heat stress in summer, but it's quite a severe cause of allergen for many people. So um, I would probably go for one of those because they're the dominant things. The botanist in me would probably go for something a bit recherche, like um, uh, marsh sow thistle. Cool. <laughs> I have to look that one up later on. Um, so that segues ah. nicely into the question yes. about <laughs> London Plain, as neat as it implies. I know the answer, uh, <laughs> but I'll give you the floor this time. <laughs> <laughs> so London Plain um, is actually a hybrid of two species of plane trees. Um, probably has hybridised many occasions. Um, one of its parents is from the Balkans and Southeast Europe, and the other parent species is from North America. Oh, um, yes, a question um, highlighting what you're talking about, um, losing wild plants. Um, with species decreasing, which plant would you be saddest to leave London for good? every single one i think it's fair to say that we are seeing as much as non the non-native flora is fascinating and amazing london's native plants are broadly speaking doing very very badly um, with a relatively few exceptions um, um i think it's probably something that we think of as generally being really common that is dwindling fairly rapidly would be um, common knapweed. All oh, right, yeah. These, is, these uh, common yeah. plants we're losing bit by bit without even noticing. Yeah, it's yeah, you're right. I mean, it's a bit like um, when we were doing birds the other week, sparrows and swifts, they kind of disappeared without people noticing as well in many respects. Um, um, Leanne um, has questions about how, how the hot weather has affected plants um, over the summer mm. and also about connected to that how the flowers are affecting the bee population as well. Right, yes. So heat stress and uh, water loss stress are things which, you know, it's fair to say our native and often non-native flora is not used to dealing with. One of the things that we know is certainly with trees and shrubs, particularly large veteran trees, that the debt in terms of damage can take decades to sort of come through. So we're seeing trees, you know, over the last decade or so, which are failing because of damage done to them in 1976, the famous drought here in, in England. Yeah. So the, the damage can be long term and slow. For smaller plants and herbaceous plants, you know, you are seeing death of individual plants quite quickly, in particularly in hot, dry areas, in a, because urban areas tend to be hotter and drier anyway. You will also find that those heat stress plants are producing less nectar and almost certainly their pollen fertility will be degraded as well. So you're losing reproductive capacity for those plants as well as their nutritional value to invertebrates. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's true. Um, there was a question um, we skipped earlier on uh, talking about marshes. Um, it says within the UK having some of the world's best marshes and London having the wetlands in South London and Raynham, um, obviously um, East London way. Are we home to any success stories of note or any disasters? That's from Joe. <laughs> um, my favourite wetland in the London area, which is often overlooked because of the celebrity of Raynham, is Crayford Marsh. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's an amazing piece of landscape. It's got layers of English history, which is in itself fascinating and tells wonderful stories of the London area. But it has one of my favourite and charismatic plants, which is the marsh south thistle, which I mentioned earlier on. And the marsh south thistle is a plant of fenland and wetland. It is still locally frequent in parts of East Anglia, although again it's lost a lot of its population through the draining of the fens. Up until the early 20th century, marsh south thistle was found locally frequently through much of what is now Greater London, the Isle of Dogs, parts of Battersea, etc, etc. Obviously urbanisation largely did away with those habitats and marsh south thistle was thought to be extinct in London. Up until the 1960s when one wild patch was found on the River Cray down in South East London near Crayford Marsh where I saw it in the early 2000s. Tragically, that last wild population was destroyed. Thankfully, I foresaw doom and I collected seed about two years beforehand, which we successfully propagated and replanted in a wonderful piece of wetland about 200 yards away from the last known wild site. So that's probably my sort of uh, personal kind of favourite story about amazing wetlands. But the River Thames and, and the Thames grazing marshes are incredibly important and it's fair to say the current loosening of planning law is probably going to prove disastrous for many of these sites. Cool. Um, <laughs> Someone's um, referencing Budley there for you, Mark. I know <laughs> Budley is one of your favourite plants. <laughs> Would you like to give your um, two minute view on Budley, Mark? <laughs> oh, <laughs> friend now, or ladies, foe? <laughs> <laughs> yes, now, ladies and gentlemen, Trevor's laughing because he's, he's heard my comments on Budley, and probably quite a few of you have before. Budley is most definitely not helpful in the wider landscape. Having it in your garden is a lovely and delightful thing, but Budlia is increasingly problematic in that it's outcompeting diverse native vegetation um, and non-native vegetation for that matter. It is moving on to chalk grasslands, et cetera, et cetera, and cliff habitats. It is also not that good for pollinators, frankly. There's no clear evidence that it really is a useful plant. And I'm going to try and keep that brief, otherwise Trevor will tell me off. It's, it's funny, you know, Mark, because um, I think I told you before, some people from um, other charities are still promoting Budley as a plant um, that is good. So it's an interesting debate that goes on in the background on Budley. Yeah, yeah, I think it's unfortunate that... Uh, we won't name and shame we've, anyone. <laughs> we've shot ourselves in the foot in that increasingly people from some of the um, animal-oriented charities, invertebrate charities, are... Um, coming out of the closet, so to speak, and saying, actually, this is a problem. Budlier is certainly in London, it is out competing diverse habitat, which could have a really fantastic assemblage of other plants that would support a much wider range of uh, creatures. Cool. Thank you, Mark. Um, and uh, there's a question for someone who lives close to the ancient woodland or Queenswood, um, which I think is in North London. Um, do yeah. you have any specific recommendations what to look for in ancient woodland in the next couple of weeks? What sort of now, one of the, so Queen's Woodland, Queen's Wood and those woods around there are fantastic, much supported and loved by a fantastic botanist and ecologist called David Bevan, who's now retired, a real hero of London's natural history. Um, now, the, the, the pretty things of most ancient woodlands have largely finished when it comes to plants now. They go to sleep because most woodland plants tend to flower in the spring in Britain because they need the extra sunlight and the water, etc, etc. But we are heading into the fungus period. So Queen's wood is starting to, will start to come alive, particularly with the rain we've had the last few days, with lots of interesting fungi. Cool. And then we can do a little plug for you there as well, that hopefully all being well, um, you'll be back in Holland Park to do our Fungi Foray um, early <laughs> November as well. Um, yes. So yeah, we're near the end of our questions. Um, uh, Maria's asking for the name of the group um, um, that does the recording in London. That's the London Naturalist Society, um, which obviously yes. 
I would say to everybody, if you're not members of a natural history group and you're kind of slightly overawed by the diversity of plants, the best thing you can do is join a group. In London, the London Natural History Society is a very friendly community. Um, we're very open to beginners and non-experts um, and we don't touch you if you don't know what the plant is. We're very keen to get more people um, to come along um, and you can welcome to join our walks. Um, you don't have to become a member, you can just come along and say hi to us and you know, hopefully bit by bit you'll become part of our community. So for Londoners, the London Natural History Society and but also on a national level, the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland. Cool. And then um, the penultimate question is, um, I think you may have my answer this. What is the rarest species of plant in Greater London area? The rarest one. Ah, in Greater London. <laughs> I mean, the lizard, um, nationally, the lizard orchid is, ah, no, no, no. Chalk milkwort, which I have not mentioned, uh, grows in the very south of London um, in tiny populations which are probably on the brink of extinction is nationally endangered. So that's probably the rarest on the national scale but in within London probably the rarest plant in London is the lizard orchid because that one plant is the only one we know of in the whole of Greater London. Cool. Thank you, Mark. And the last question is um, a question um, about the bee population. How has a change in London's wild plant population affected the bee population? Ooh. Now, I'm no expert on bees and I don't really do things with faces, legs and wings. Um, but I would imagine probably quite profound. I also imagine it's probably something that we will never be able to answer because we don't have probably detailed enough information on the, the, the structure of plants, say 100, 200 years ago, and the bee, bee and other invertebrate communities that we'd found in London. So it's quite hard to be absolutely clear, but I strongly suspect, you know, many of our native non-honeybee species are not doing well. And that is probably in part due to the increase of non-native species such as Budlia, because many of these bee species are often associated with a few types of plant. They're called oligolects. Um, so, for example, the ivy bee only lives pretty much off ivy. So if you reduce the abundance and the availability of some of these native plants in their communities, and replace it with something that those native bees are not used to, such as Budlia, it's not particularly good news for some of these species. Okay, great. Um, so again, Mark, thank you for your time. There's a lot of um, <laughs> very positive comments, um, particularly Wayne said he stayed up at 4.30 a.m. Whoa. Um, so um, thank you, Wayne, for your, for your time as well. And um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. So apologies again for the technical difficulties, but um hope you all agree that Mark is a very entertaining and a very informative speaker, as always. And hopefully you can come and join us for a funky four-way in person with Mark, hopefully in November. Um, Two weeks time, we've got a talk on common lizards um, with Emily from Frog Life. And if you're interested in trees, I'm doing a tree talk tomorrow um, afternoon and details are on um, the email I sent out earlier as well. So thank you again, Mark, and thank you everyone for attending and have a good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. Good night. Thanks. Oof.